This video is sponsored by World of Fortune. It's very good game and you should play it. Shh. Hello, my name is Laserpig. Formerly a child genius with the intelligence of the average adult, now an adult with the intelligence of an average adult. And welcome to Stories of Things That Have Already Happened. Come with me into a journey into the past. It's World War I, the first World War, an intense war between major powers on a scale that has never been seen before. In an instant, the peace which had erupted across Europe after the fall of Napoleon is shattered, and suddenly all the established rules and doctrine and tactics of the modern military are thrown at the window and replaced by generals, staring at each other over a drinks cabinet and shrugging. A stalemate ensues. When you have major world armies locked in a stalemate, things get just a little little bit wacky. And as wacky wars go, World War One, well, it's pretty up there. Because as we all know, you have one of three ways to win a war, and that third way is you just let someone else do the fighting and, and Wallace and Gromit your way out of any situation, building an elaborate series of contraptions and machines, and what is that noise? What is going on? What is the- what is- oh god, oh what- what is this? Get away from what it- you don't know! Hi! Do you like war? Do you like ships? But do you wish you could do both at the same time? There has to be an easier way! Well, boy, I shit you not! Get on down to World of Warships today! If you like ships with guns in them, you won't be disappointed! We've got over 400 of them, each one alive with museum quality like detail! Wanna know what France's only aircraft carrier during World War II looked like? There it is! And look! The little shoot thing lift comes up and down and um, there's, there's a carriage. I don't know what this is. Anyway. And that's not all. We got big ships, small ships, skinny ships, wide ships, sexy ships, flat ships, underwater ships, ships your mum would like, French ships, ships for your neck beard, even a ship that looks like a castle. Historically accurate. Book a test drive today and play in over 40 stunning 12v12 arena maps, each one enhanced by World of Warships' new graphical updates. There has never been a better time to buy a new or used warship. Make the school runs a breeze knowing your daughter will be protected behind 23 inches of solid steel. Take that, Wanda. Where's your 4x4 now? Join the expanding community of over 44 million players. Play alone, play with friends, complain and chat endlessly about how submarines are overpowered, and then try to play one yourself and die within the first 12 seconds. For free! That's right, no cash down, no credit, no problem. Keep your wallet at home. And even better, I'm going to do something for you. Download now with the code FIRE. That's code FIRE, and I'll give you 200 to Blooms to get you started. 20 restless fire camouflage, 7 days of a premium account, and a million credits! All of which can help you boost into the medium tiers where you can try out the all new line of French cruisers. <laughs> but wait, there's more! Because if you missed it first time, then hold your ass firmly with both hands because it's back! Starwing! Download now code FIRE and receive this Tier 5 Premium USS Texas absolutely free. You heard right, absolutely free. So go ahead, what are you waiting for? Don't wait for this video to end. Go ahead and download it now, right now. Why are you still here? Why are you not downloading Road of Warships? Was I not convincing enough? Do you, do you not love me? Anyway, previous wars, that is, wars prior to the First World War, had been fought, if you'll pardon my lack of a better term, by gentlemen. Wars were supposed to be civilized and fought between generals with fantastic mustaches, with the peasantry really only there to do their duty, which was to stand in a neat little line and get shot at. Now, of course, we know war, especially as it was during the Napoleonic era, was anything but civilized, but this has always been the sort of loose interpretation of events, especially by the Napoleonic equivalent of the Veribu. Yes, they do exist. This is largely because whatever the common soldier was doing was considered somewhat unimportant. And the emphasis has always been placed on the great leaders, whose triumphs and mannerisms have often been exploited as propaganda symbols for their respective countries. 
But World War I comes along and completely shatters that illusion. It's one of the first wars, perhaps THE first war, where the emphasis is not placed on the military leaders, who are often depicted as stuffy and incompetent, but instead on the common man. It's one of the first major wars where common soldiers were awarded medals for distinguished conduct, which had really only kind of started happening since Crimea. I mean, previously soldiers who were present at certain battles might receive a, a campaign medal, provided they could read, write and prove they were actually there, which very few could. It's the war that really changes the opinion of the public on who the typical soldier actually was. I mean, previously opinion on soldiers had been very low. Uh, people went into the army because because they were desperate, because it was a choice between service or prison, or because they were homeless or poor and had been press ganged into it. To the average civilian, soldiers brought trouble. They were loud and arrogant and extremely rude and were quick to rape, loot and pillage if left unsupervised, or at least that was the common depiction. In comparison, the officers were gentlemen. They spoke proper, they dressed well, they spoke with authority, and when the war went well, they were the ones to take the credit. Credit. Now, when World War I rolls around, all of this completely changes. The common soldier becomes the courageous Tommy, the stoic German, the noble colonial, the heroic Yankee, and you know, so on and so forth. Their culture, their lives, their letters, poems and experiences become the focal point for study and representation of the First World War not the officers. So in all aspects of that war, bar one, we lose this idea of gentlemanly warfare and gentlemanly conduct in war, and instead this idea of unrestricted warfare comes into play. And one of the biggest ways we can see that is in submarine warfare and the loss of the so-called cruiser rules. You may be thinking, what, what has this got to do with ocean liners? Shush, I'm getting there. Be quiet. Now, the cruiser rules are a series of very sort of gentlemen's agreements on the treatment of non-combatants, mainly merchants, in naval warfare. Under cruiser rules, if you were to engage a merchant ship, you had to signal that ship that you were going to attack them, and only if they chose to ignore you and carry on did you then have permission to open fire, and even then, if they signalled surrender or made any obvious attempts to abandon ship, you had to stop and allow it, and then you became responsible for that cruise safety. Now, of course, that has its problems. If you have a huge convoy of merchant ships, a single cruiser can stop that convoy, take the crew's prisoner, and either tow the merchant ships or put prize crews on board, and suddenly whatever they were carrying now belongs to them. Meaning, if you were shipping weapons from, let's just say, a neutral third-party country that just so happens to be exclusively supplying you with weapons, and not the other side, and that ship was stopped and seized by something as pathetic small as a torpedo boat, then for almost no effort, you've delivered a shitload of weapons into the hands of your enemy. Weapons you'd paid for. The other problem, of course, was submarines. Now, it has been argued that submarines were not naval vessels and thus immune to the cruiser rules. In fact, so harsh was Britain's stance on submarines not being proper naval vessels that it became tradition for British submarines to fly the Jolly Roger rather than the naval ensign. Now, contrary to popular belief, submarines of that age would typically surface and fight using their deck guns. I mean, torpedoes back then were unreliable, they were heavy, they were expensive, and very difficult to come by. So they were used sparingly and against priority targets, which, which is why you get these designs for these submarines with massive battleship-like deck guns, which to people who really only know submarines from studying Second World War designs, that concept seems almost comedic. But if you're in a world where you're really only kind of fighting merchant ships and you have to be economical with your torpedoes, it makes perfect sense. So submarines would surface, give the merchants warning, and the merchant would typically surrender. But a submarine was small and didn't really have the capability to take prisoners. But to a point, they did try to follow the cruiser rules. Now, going back to my earlier point, sub submarines back then were not really designed to operate for days at sea independently. They would typically have tender vessels, which, you know, would follow them around and contain stuff like kitchens, beds, recreational facilities, repair shops, you know, the kind of thing that you and your crew needs in their downtime. But what 
this means is that that one ship acting as a tender has maybe like five or six smaller ships that could just easily comb a large area, stay undetected from warships, and cause a merchant ship to surrender just by surfacing and pointing a gun at them. Naturally, someone in the Admiralty thought that this was slightly unfair, and saw reason that maybe submarines were having it just a little bit too easy. What if the merchant ships didn't need to surrender? What if they shot back? I mean, if you put guns on a merchant ship, the submarine would just never surface if it saw the guns. And if a proper naval vessel ship saw those guns, well, it doesn't need to follow cruiser rules anymore, and can just engage it like any other ship, rendering this idea of armed merchants completely useless. Merchants were supposed to be merchants, not soldiers, and if you give them guns, you basically just put them in danger of being blown up by a battleship from several miles away. So, what we need is a merchant ship that looks like any other merchant ship, but has secret weapons on board that it can shoot its submarines with. So, along comes this idea of a Q-ship. A top secret project in which we take the hull of a merchant vessel, outfit it with armour, radio antennas, and guns hidden inside little compartments, you know, like James Bond shit, like really stuff that British people really love, like hidden guns on ships. Now, this kind of ship is designed to look like a very juicy target to a submarine. That submarine surfaces, waves its gun around, the crew make a show of the preparing to abandon ship, and at the last minute, once that submarine is close enough, they open up the false compartments and just open fire on the submarine, taking it completely by surprise when she's at her most vulnerable, which is, well, sitting on the surface. Not the first time this has happened. HMS Kingfisher, for example, was a fourth-rate ship of the line built in 1675, which disguised itself as a merchant vessel with cannons hidden behind false bulkheads, crews dressed as merchants, and an obvious precious cargo scattered all over her deck in, in an attempt to lure in pirates. Which did actually work, and it was very successful. But of course, the existence of the Q-ships just pisses the Germans off, and in fact, they consider it a war crime, and many still do consider it a war crime. But it made the submarine commanders become a little bit nervous at taking a surrendering ship at its word, and this would eventually lead to something called unrestricted submarine warfare, where U-boats would basically shoot first and ask questions later. I mean, a crew could be given plenty of time to abandon their ship once the vessel was actually sinking, lessening the risk that they would be tempted to open fire with any hidden guns they might have. Then the Germans, because they're crafty like that, came up with a much, much better idea. What instead of having a regular merchant ship designed to shoot submarines? Marines, we have a merchant ship disguised as an enemy merchant ship that would join convoys. And when it got dark and everyone was asleep and there was very few hands on deck and most importantly no one could see anything, then that merchant ship could drop its disguise, open fire, cause a huge amount of confusion, chaos and damage, and before anyone could really figure out what was going on, they could then just hide all its guns and pretend to be just another merchant vessel. No one's none the wiser. What's going on? Why is everything exploding? <laughs> but of course that has to be kept very top secret, because if Britain ever gets wind that this is what's going on, that would make them highly suspicious of any ship trying to join a convoy. So it has to be a ship that no one in their right mind would ever suspect. And sitting just off the coast of South America was a perfect ship. An ocean liner. Now, Ocean liners of the day were really nothing more than over-glorified transport ships. Yes, they were luxurious and they had many entertainment features on board that we now associate with modern-day cruise ships. You know, swimming pools, indoor tennis courts, spas, restaurants, dueling arenas. But their purpose was just to transport people to a specific destination, and they were designed to do that in the shortest amount of time. So they were designed to be fast. Merits and awards to ocean liners were typically handed out for their speed more than their comforts. In fact, ocean liners were getting so speedy that by the Second World War they were being used to ferry troops across the Atlantic completely unescorted, because their speed basically allowed them to outrun not only any battleship, but also any submarine that would think to give chase. The most famous of these being the RMS Queen Mary, who was nicknamed the Grey Ghost by the German U-boat crews, mainly for her distinct grey wartime camouflage, but also because they could never find her, save for a passing glimpse on the horizon. So an ocean liner becomes the favourite choice for a new breed of Q-ships. No one in their right mind would ever be suspicious of a heavily crewed liner. I mean, that's, that's they're a liner, that's what they're supposed to be doing. I mean, it could easily join a convoy, as ocean liners were being used to transport men and equipment, and if it was discovered, or if it had to make a quick exit, it could easily outrun anything which attempted to give chase. And that perfect ship I mentioned was one of the latest and most modern and fastest ocean liners at the time. 
the Cap Trafalgar. And, as luck would have it, the Trafalgar had one tiny, peculiar trait. I mean, outside of a few minor details, she struck a very considerable similarity to that of the British ocean liner RMS Carmania. A uh, much older ship, yes, but as luck would have it, one that kind of operated in the same water, so no one would ever be suspicious of seeing her around South America. Now, the Trafalgar had just been requisitioned by the German Navy to be used as an auxiliary cruiser, so she was already somewhere where she could be refitted, and the idea of using her as an armoured merchant had been floated around. So, as she lay in the port of Trinidad, she was met by a German gunboat who, under the cover of darkness, surrendered all her weapons and then scuttled herself so that no one would be none the wiser. Trafalgar would receive two four-inch naval cannons as well as a number of anti-air autocannons known as pom-poms. Not that pom-pom. Head out of the gutter, people, come on. She also had a little extra armor welded to her boiler rooms and sandbags placed around some of the more major areas, as well as her carpets, which were torn up, rolled up, and jammed along the sides to give that little bit of extra protection against shrapnel. With her armament in place, the ship was then repainted to represent the Carmania, even her third funnel being removed to complete the illusion. Her crew were then replaced by the much more experienced naval crew of the gunboat, and given the order to sink as much British merchant shipping as they could, by joining convoys and attacking them during the night. It was the perfect plan, and it lasted until just about the end of her first voyage. In September of 1914, the new Q-ship set off on its maiden voyage, but after sailing around for a few days and finding absolutely nothing, she then returned to Trinidad for refueling. But just as she was making her way into port, she spotted smoke on the horizon. Seeing her chance, she sailed out to meet this foe. The two ships were on opposite sides of an island. They could only see each other's smoke. There, was a, there were several attempts to radio each other with wireless messages, but these messages seemed very confusing and... No, this is Patrick didn't really seem to make much sense, so it wasn't until the two ships finally turned the corner and came face to face for the first time that the Cap Trafalgar laid eyes on its opponent for the first time, the Cap Trafalgar. The ship was staring at what looked like an exact replica of itself. Both ships sat staring at each other for quite some time. The crew were confused at exactly what they were looking at. It was their own ship staring back at them. It was the Cap Trafalgar. A few confusing signals were sent out and slowly the reality of what was going on began to unfold. The ship they had just come face to face with, the first ship of the Cap Trafalgar's top secret Q-boat mission, was the Carmania. The ship they were disguised as, disguised as them. The two ships began to circle each other, caught in an awkward position and unsure how to proceed. Both ships were armed, but not sufficiently well, with both ships having hidden and disguised their guns that neither could really see what the other ship was armed with. So both ships sent out coded messages, announcing that they had engaged each other, and that there was no combat-capable vessels nearby. They were both alone. So in a rare callback to prior wars, the ships reached a gentleman's agreement. Like in the days of old, they would settle this matter with a duel. It's time to do 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 The two ships sailed side by side out into more open water, and then separated, moving off a short distance away from each other, and after getting far enough away to start manoeuvring, the two ships turned. The first naval duel between ocean liners in history was about to begin. <laughs> Now, there was no real plan for exactly when the ships were supposed to turn and fire, so as the Camaria looked back, they noticed the Trafalgar reveal her guns, and to the Camaria's surprise and somewhat joy, realised they heavily outgunned their foe. The Trafalgar had only two four-inch guns, the Camaria had eight. It is thus, perhaps with this excitement and the anticipation of perhaps an easy victory, that the Carmania was the first to open fire. However, the shot missed, and had fired much too early, and as the Camaria turned, the Trafalgar swung the opposite way, and the shot rang past the ship. But now it was the Trafalgar's turn, and unlike the Camaria, the Trafalgar's crew were maybe a little bit better trained, being the former gunboat crew. They were used to the guns she operated and managed to get off an early shot, but not used to the size of their new ship, and thus the higher elevation they were now operating on, the shot fell short, sending a great plume of water across the Kermania's deck. 
By now, both ships had turned and began to circle each other. Kermania was able to bring four of her guns to bear, and both ships began opening fire simultaneously. But because neither ship had fire control systems or ammunition belts and lifts like a regular battleship, ammunition had to be brought up from the storeroom, to which both captains had wisely decided to keep below the waterline, bringing back the old Age of Sail era job of the Powder Monkey, a term used for people, mainly children, though in this case it was just whoever happened to not be doing anything, to bring boxes of ammunition up from the storeroom room to the guns, which was pretty exhausted work. The two ships could not maneuver well, so for the majority of the battle they fought broadside to broadside, at one point closing within mere meters of each other, the, the crew both firing machine guns from their deck where, where they had no guns through grenades, and when they had no grenades they gathered the silverware from the restaurant and threw that instead. It is perhaps at this moment as the crew of the Trafalgar were picking fancy knives and forks out of the side of their hull that they had a bit of an epiphany. We're not facing a battleship, a heavily armoured battleship with heavy armour here, we're facing a completely unarmoured ocean liner. Any gun will penetrate that hull, any gun. So they opened fire with the anti-air cannons. The effect was absolutely devastating. Kermania was plastered in hits, peppering her decks and forcing the crew to seek refuge within the hull. Worried at the damage his ship was now taking, the captain of the Kermania ordered the ship to veer off, but by then the damage was done. Fires began to spark all across the ship, including in the cabin directly below the bridge, and within an instant the bridge was engulfed in flames, and the officers on board were forced to retreat to the aft section. However, as the Kermania veered off, the two rear guns briefly came within perfect sight of the Trafalgar's hull, and being less than a hundred meters away, the crew took full opportunity to lay in a little revenge, putting shots straight through Trafalgar's waterline. The Trafalgar began listing to one side, and the ship was forced to veer off to right herself. With both ships now heavily damaged, it would seem the only logical option would be, you know, just to call it a draw, right? WRONG! There is an often overlooked tragedy in wartime that, well, let me put it like this. Say World War III breaks out and there's mass conscription and you and all your buddies are drafted into the army. You, maybe you think, perfect, I, I've been desperate for an opportunity like this. It's finally time to take the fight to the Russians or the Chinese or the, the, the underground mole people or whoever next becomes our biggest fabricated enemy to justify Lockheed Martin's next budget inflation. Point is, if an event like that happened, the majority of the people who want it to happen and who would be first in the queue at the recruitment office probably envision themselves as being on the front lines, fighting through cities and tearing over vast countrysides and tanks and futuristic armoured vehicles. It never really occurs to them that they might spend the entire war, what would be the defining chapter of the 21st century, pushing a broom around a supply closet or repairing trucks in a motor pool, or are driving a general around to staff meetings, or guarding an outpost that never, ever comes under attack. And that can be a bit of a sore point when you start meeting veterans. The vast majority of them never saw combat because, well, those were the ones who survived. Most of the vets you find worked largely in logistics or motor pools or as engineers. You don't often find a veteran still kicking around for took the bridge at Arnhem. It is perhaps for this reason that both the Trafalgar and the Kermania, now both heavily damaged and in spite of being in perfect positions just to flee, decided to take the actions they did. Gunboat captains posted to remote locations rarely get the opportunity to distinguish themselves in combat, and neither probably wanted to admit to future generations that they spent the Great War driving an ocean liner around and ran away from their first battle that wasn't against an unarmoured merchant. So, perhaps aware that this was their one opportunity to walk away with a heroic story, both ships turned and began charging directly towards each other. While all this was going on, watching from the shore, horrified at the events he was witnessing, was Captain Langerhan, the original civilian captain of the Cap Trafalgar, who had been put off his ship and left in charge of an empty tender vessel. He watched from a distance as his prize command was torn apart. Furious that he could do nothing, he gathered his crew and quickly searched for any weapon which he could arm his empty tanker with. But the island was somewhat scarce of weapons. 
But after searching, he was able to find an 18th century bronze mortar from God knows where, presumably being used as a monument to some battle or another. With this ridiculous weapon now mounted to his deck, he sailed out into the battle and began firing at the Camarnia, filling the mortar with coal and hoping to shower the ship with shrapnel and maybe start a fire or something. After firing once, the mortar created a huge amount of smoke, but otherwise did little else than briefly interrupt the battle, giving time for both ships to move into a perfect broadside position. The two ships opened fire simultaneously. Trafalgar took aim at Camarnia's decks, attempting to take out her guns, while Camarnia began firing shots at Trafalgar's waterline. By the time the two ships had passed each other, both ships were on fire and heavily listing to one side. But the Camarnia was afloat. The same could not be said for the Cap Trafalgar. The shots along her waterline had created a considerable damage to her hull, and since the ship had been travelling at full speed, as she executed a sharp turn, it ripped a hole straight along her bow. With severe flooding in her lower decks, the crew could no longer keep the listing under control. She was now leaning at a nearly 30 degree angle, and fearing she could capsize, the crew began to abandon ship. Camarnia ceased fire allowing the tanker to approach the strucken vessel to rescue survivors. But the Camarnia had other problems. The ship was heavily fire damaged and with almost no working equipment, she was little more than a hulk. The crew were fighting to keep her afloat and observers on the decks reported seeing smoke on the horizon. Both ships had been sending SOS messages and the crew now feared a German warship had arrived. Fearing they might be captured or sunk, the Camarnia turned at full speed and fled. The ship she actually saw was no more than another armoured merchant, which has a name that I'm not even going to try and pronounce. The ship took stock of the situation and presumed the Camarnia was attempting to lead it into a trap, and thus it too turned and fled. Kermania would spend another two days at sea, struggling to stay afloat. She would eventually rendezvous with the British cruiser, who immediately placed her under tow, and she was taken back to Brazil for emergency repairs, and then on to Gibraltar, where she was fully repaired and brought back into service. The entire crew, including the civilian crew who had remained on board and acted as the powder monkeys during the battle, were all awarded the Distinguished Service Medal. Kermania would continue operating as a Q-ship for a further two years, before being converted into a troop transport, and after the war she would have the honour of transporting American and Canadian troops home before she was returned to Cunard Line as an ocean liner once again. Her bell is still on display on board the Wellington, which sits on the Thames in London and is home to the honourable company of Master Marinas, whoever they are. Apparently, if you ask nice, they will let you ring it. Well, they'll let you ring it, they won't answer my emails anymore. Anyway. Okay, so before I conclude this video, just a quick note, since I know a lot of people are going to be very, very angry in the comments about this. There is a bit of a debate about the factual accuracy of certain events, in particular that the Camaria was disguised as the Cap Trafalgar. And it is true that very little evidence exists for this. Now, so just to put a stop to the arguments, I'm going to put this debate to bed once and for all. Hopefully. I, I, I mean, probably not, but you know, I, I can but try. So when people envision this fight, they envision this image of the two ships sort of resembling what they looked like in civilian service. This is not true. Both ships were in wartime colours, which is this very, very dark grey. Now, the Cap Trafalgar was not directly disguised as the Carmania. It, it, it was disguised as, quote-unquote, a British ship, which was never named, which is according to its own logs. But it's it's very likely that the ship would have used the Carmania as a reference on, on how to disguise themselves as a British ship. After all, both ships ran the same lines, they operated in the same waters, they knew each other. So it was a British ship that they had seen many, many times before, making it an ideal reference. So when both ships turned that corner, they would have seen another ship that looked exactly like their own, painted the same dark grey colour, giving the impression that they were disguised as each other. And since most, if not all, the evidence for this event is eyewitness accounts from both crews, because casualties were very light, and sailors gossip like old fishwives, the idea that both ships were actually disguised as each other becomes this debate between people who exclusively take their facts from eyewitness reports, which say it was true, and people who exclusively take their facts from after-action reports and the documents and the orders, which say it isn't, with the actual truth, as things like this typically are, being somewhere in the middle. Anyway, that's all from me. I've been Laserpig. I'm fantastic. Big thank you to the administrative error that caused World of Warships to sponsor me one 
once again. I mean, they've been working hard on trying to bring new content to the game. So whatever your impression of that game is, just, just give it another try. For me, link in the description. Anyway, no song today because I'm feeling ill and also because my neighbour is having a party. And if I start singing, it will trigger an impromptu karaoke night. Which would be fun for you in the next 10 seconds of this video, but not so much for me if you would have to sit and listen to it all night. Anyway, go away. of Nelson, he's come to destroy us all! Ah! Ah! Bathwater now available on all stores willing to sell it.